Okay, yeah, I think it's uh, time to begin the webinar. Thank you for joining us. My name is Simon Clark. I am the Committee Programme Coordinator here at the EGU. And today we'll be discussing the IPCC uh, at COP26. We'll be looking at science, its role in policy and decision-making, um, and what that means uh, for the future, but also what that means for science policy collaboration. Uh, to talk with me on this subject, uh, we have Dr. Sarah Connors, who is uh, Head of Science at Working Group 1 of the IPCC. Um, Sarah, would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> yeah, sure. Hi, Simon. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, yeah, so my name is Sarah Connors. Um, I'm the Head of the Science Team at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, uh, the Working Group 1 branch of that, and I am the Head of Science uh, in the technical support unit there. Um, so I guess that means that I work kind of in the science policy interface. Um, and my background, did you ask about my background? I can tell you a bit of my background if you want. <laughs> oh yeah, please tell me a bit about who you are, <laughs> your background. Um, yeah. Sure. Uh, my background is, um, well, it's got a, a background in atmospheric science. I was trained as a chemist and then went into do a PhD in estimating methane emissions. But then I left academia and started looking at science policy and I was actually a science policy fellow at the EGU before doing uh, my job at the IPCC. Can I just uh, ask you what motivated you to shift from pure academia into uh, more policy orientated work? Um, that's a good question. I think I really liked um, trying to find uh, the more actionable side of, of research. I, was re I really loved research, but I didn't see it as something that I wanted to do, like really the, the details of, of research for, for the entire of my career. So I wanted to try and do something that's a little bit more applied. Um, and so, yeah, I liked, I liked that sort of bridge between looking at what influences policy and, and how much science is taken into consideration. Um, and then, yeah, just by chance, the job at the IPCC was advertised. So I, I decided to give it a go. And yeah, five years later, I'm still doing it. So it's going okay. Five years later, you are head of science. Yeah, um, <laughs> somehow. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, as head of science of Working Group One, um, could you tell us more about what Working Group One does, uh, especially yeah. like the broader structure of the IPCC? There's multiple working groups. Um, yeah. What do you focus on? Yeah, it's a bit of a complicated um, structure and process with the IPCC. So it's an, it's an international organization at the global level um, and it's sort of structured into different, primarily there's three working groups, different working groups, and they have this um, like fo different focus to look at different aspects of climate change. And working group one is more about the, like the physical climate science aspects. So what is causing global warming um, how is the world changing and responding because of the like the emissions that we're putting into the atmosphere? Um, and it, so it looks at a lot of the like the physical changes that, that are associated with climate change. That's working group one. And then there's working group two and working group three. Working group two is more about the adaptation side of, of what you need to do to adapt to the changes we're seeing from climate change, but also on the impacts as well. Um, and so that might assess things to do with um, like how vulnerable um, or the exposure there is for different people or different ecosystems, different regions. So that's, that's really their mandate to look at like, the impacts and the, the adaptation side. And then working group three is the mitigation side. So that's more about like what, what would need to, to happen or what are the different options of, of what, uh, what could happen in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions so to limit the, the effects of, of, of climate change. And there's other, there's various other bits in the IPCC as well, but that's like the three main working groups that, that produce these huge reports. So working group one really focuses on the physical science basis mm -hmm. of the report. Um, and so the sixth assessment report uh, was published last August, and it's the latest in a series of updates um, on a scientific con consensus of climate change that's been ongoing since uh, 1990. Yeah, um, the uh, first report was 1990, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so the media headlines painted, um, I think I've had to say, a quite a gloomy picture of the future. But um, I know quite a few climate scientists also stress that this report wasn't about um, hope of solutions as well. 
Um, I was wondering if you could just share with us what the key messages that came out of the recent report was yeah, or were. Definitely. So actually, before I start, I'll just put in a couple of links into the chat because then people can have a look themselves. But uh, this link is just to the general IPCC report like website. So you can have a look at what uh, what the report covers in its summary and its chapters and, and all that kind of um, uh, like it's basically all the details as well as the, the high, high level statements as well. And then the second link I'm putting in is um, a link to what we call is the interactive atlas. So this is um, a website where you can uh, discover like how climate change is happening on the regional level. So you can like look at your region and see like what's changing or what is um, projected to change in the future. Um, and so yeah, with the, with those links, you can kind of explore yourselves. But on the on the like the high level side of of this report, it was released in August and. Um, yeah, because we don't look at the adaptation and mitigation aspects of climate change, you don't really we don't have the mandate to talk too much about like the solutions. So I can understand why <laughs> it could have been um, seen as quite doom and gloom, but that's that's because the the next steps of the story will be coming out with the Working Group two and three reports, and they're going to be released hopefully early next year. So hopefully we can build on the story that Working Group one is it has started. Um, like later on in, in or earlier earlier next year um, but in terms of our report and the main messages we had were well I guess from in terms of where we are now we we've known for like decades that the, the world is warming we've, we've it, that's been reported for, for for decades and now it's the first time that the IPCC has said it's you know um, it's you it's undeniably due to human influence um, I think the last report in 2013 said it's like 95% sure, so um, like virtually certain that, that it's humans. Now we're like, yeah, it's a, it's a statement of fact. Um, and the changes that we're seeing on, um, like on the long-term context, are are really rapid. They're they're widespread. It's not just you know temperatures are going up. We're seeing changes in all aspects of the climate system. You know, like the biosphere, the atmosphere, the cryosphere, the oceans. We're seeing changes everywhere there. Um, and it seems to be well. No, it is. It is intensifying. Like this, this, this climate change seems to be getting more and more intense. And some aspects seem to be accelerating, like sea level rise. There's a there's um there's proof that this this seems to be this is accelerating in the the, the, the recent past. Um, some of these exchange, some of these uh, results are unprecedented in like thousands of years. Um, CO two hasn't been this high for two million years. Um, and some of the projected changes that we look at in the future could mean that the temperatures of the world could go up to levels that we haven't, the earth hasn't seen for like 20 to 50 million years. So it's really going into like uncharted territory. So I can understand why people might have thought this is <laughs> a bit of a wake up call um, report. Um, in terms of the changes we're seeing, um, they're happening not only in every aspect of the climate system, you're also seeing it in every region of the world. It's not like you can say this region is, is escaping the impacts, it's all the effects from the changes. Um, we, 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 we can find human attributed changes everywhere. Um, and these changes will be increasing as further warming continues. And one of the worst things, like one of the saddest points from the high um, from the results for me was that a lot of this is um, it's it's basically it's irreversible like we can we can stabilize temperatures but we it's really hard to for, for many aspects of the climate system to really bring it back to what it was before um, so yeah there's sort of like an incentive to um, if, if you would like to reduce the further change that's going to happen then the incentive for that would be to implement like rapid emission reductions um, and if uh, if that doesn't happen um, then the the, the long-term like Paris Agreement goals of trying to get as close to 1.5 as possible or two degrees even two degrees are kind of going to be on beyond our, our limit if we don't act now that's paraphrasing a bit we, <laughs> but um, yeah that's kind of like the high the high level messages. <laughs> So the key takeaway is, firstly, the, this report um, is part of a bigger story as the other working groups um, publish uh, their own reports. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but at the same time, it posts a picture of an intensified climate system, which results in acceleration in some places. Mm -hmm. um, historical emissions have already cemented uh, future warming. So really to the focus, extent, yeah. to a certain extent, yeah. So the key focus now is really uh, reducing and stopping how much extra carbon we're inputting into the atmosphere and into that system. Um, yeah, so I think that kind of segues nicely into the other um, the other theme of this webinar, which is COP26. So that's the 2021 United Nations uh, Climate Change Conference, or the Conference of Parties, hence uh, COP. Um, it's been delayed since 2019. Uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So there's a lot of build up and anticipation to this particular meeting. Um, and I think that's also true, especially since it's hot on the heels of the uh, six assessment reports. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us uh, what you think the key themes at this year's COP um, would be. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So with the, with the Conference of the Parties, it runs for about two weeks. Um, and they're regular events that have been going on since I think the uh, the UNFCCC, the United, Conven United Nations Framework Convention for Climate Change, that was set up um, in a sort of global effort to try and act on on, on climate change. And so these these COPs have been regularly occurring since um, for for years on that. Um, the most famous recent one was the COP twenty one that was held in Paris, and that's where the Paris Agreement um, comes from. And so like the like the in the Paris Agreement, there were um, there's this long term goal of of trying to reduce to one, or trying to make sure global warming is limited to 1.5 degrees or un, well well below two degrees. But within that, they they have um, what they're called nationally determined contributions from countries, where they say what they can contribute in their efforts to um, tackling climate change, and so the next stage in that sort of long-term COP process is um, there's going to be a big global stock take of, of where we are at and what are people's, what are countries' actions um, going on. And I think that's scheduled for 2023. And so in the meantime, these, these COPs are trying to increase the, like the commitment from countries and further um, like motivate and, and, and increase these, these, uh, incremental uh, commitments that, that the countries are trying to to do um, and so that's like the bigger overall focus but then they will um, there are certain themes that happen almost every day that will give like a particular area of climate change or areas related to climate change focus and so um, the first couple of days is normally when the world leaders come together and it's like the big um, like the more um, like headline hitting uh, speeches occur. But then on day three, it's, it's um, the day is focused on finance, day four is focused on energy. Um, and so there's different, there's different themes that you see across the, across the, um, the conference uh, and the two weeks um, around it. And that, that's not to say that there will only be talks focusing on finance on day four, but uh, day three, sorry, it, it will be, it will, it can still be very broad, but. Yeah, there's that, that, that. Those are like the the known themes in advance that that occur in COP. So um, uh, basically, this uh, COP is giving it the opportunity to revisit the Paris Agreement. I think for since since the, since uh, COP twenty one, as you said. Yeah, it's always like an ongoing process. Like they're always they're always working on um, further discussions of what what can be done and how how can action be facilitated what action needs to be done so there's always every cop is always discussing these 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 things it's kind of ongoing and then um how how close can you be to being able to get another agreement that's that's something that's always um that's always something that you know a cop would hope to do but it doesn't necessarily mean it will always happen um so there's yeah there's there's a sort of uncertainty there of whether there would be an agreement in this cop or whether it might end up being in the next, next COP. Yeah, because that's what happened with uh, the previous COP as well, I think, is where um, there was a, they pushed back agreeing on some of the terms, I think, related to climate finance, mm -hmm. um, which I think has also built some anticipation towards this COP as well, as whether they'll reach an agreement or not. 
And there's um, also, um, I can't actually remember what it's called, but there's a sort of complimentary meeting that happens halfway through the year where there's more discussions that go on. It's just, that's more background, uh, more technical discussions. And then they, they, that preparation can then lead in to help with some of the discussions in COPS as well. So it's, it's actually quite a continuous process. People think of it as like this one big meeting once a year, but it, it, there is a lot of work in the background, I think, for many different stakeholders. Sure. So um, I guess COP is really a bit of an iceberg for the greater um, discussions and I suppose inputs that happen in the ongoing discussions around uh, response to climate change. Um, speaking of inputs, um, with the release of the uh, six assessment report um, back in August, um, how much do you think that's uh, shaped discussions at the COP this year? Yeah, um, so I wouldn't say that like COP is shaped by the IPCC reports, but what I would say is that there is room for um, the IPCC findings to be incorporated within the meeting. Um, oh, if I like, if I think more about um, like the history of, of of like the IPCC reports, like they have always provided scientific evidence and understanding for relatively um, international policy context. So the, the first assessment report, which you said came out in 1990, that, that helped um, establish evidence to show that the, the UNFCCC should be um, um, created to help tackle, um, to, to see what the world should do with climate change. And then like, the second assessment report that helped lead and give information towards the Kyoto Protocol, which was really um, which was signed in the mid 90s, and that was like looking at different um, warming uh, gases and, and really reducing reducing those like I think it was six key um, greenhouse gases. And so yeah, the the, the and then the, of course the, the the most the more recent one, the AR5, went in to help give evidence for the Paris Agreement. And so AR6 is hoping to give evidence to. Um, you know, these discussions leading up to the global, global stock take. Um, so there's always, um, there's always interest to learn about what's going on with the, with the IPCC if, if the reports have come out. Um, this cycle, which has been going on for about, uh, I don't know, five, five, six years already, we've already had three special reports that have come out. So there's been presentations about the special reports in previous COPs. Um, and yeah, so the, there's this, um, this, uh, there, there seems to be like this this willingness to to, to listen and, and incorporate it, but I wouldn't say that we it shapes the the meeting. The meeting itself is is bigger than that. It's like this huge version of EGU, <laughs> basically where, where everything is going on. <laughs> so, but um, there's certainly a, a scientific presence in um, what IPCC brings to COP, um, yeah. especially with the uh, reporting on. Um, 1.5 degree warming that came out um, a few years ago as well. Yeah. yeah, and I should probably say like it's not just IPCC that like can provide evidence. There's so many different organisations that will have different reports and findings, and you know that the science is actually incorporated in many different areas. Um, but the IPCC is kind of in this privileged position where there's there's quite a few um, like high level events where um, there will be talks and stuff. So it's um, maybe slightly more seen i don't know i don't know if that's 100 percent accurate <laughs> so i think the report um definitely lends a greater visibility then to what the, the science that ipc the ipcc puts out um so with all these ongoing discussions and from your perspective as someone um who leads within the ipcc like, what do you think the ideal outcome of cop 26 would be yeah, so I guess what well, the idea outcome is kind of what I mentioned already is that they would like this this new um, like ramped up ambitious agreement that's been that's been um, uh, agreed across all countries. Um, uh, I as, so as I was trying to allude to before, it's um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it it will happen at this COP. It might happen at the at the next the next COP, but there this is the, the focus that they're trying to, to get like an agreement across all countries to to show um, yeah to like show further commitment to help limit within the well to help keep the the goals of the Paris Agreement um, attainable 
um, I think there's there's a lot of discussion. I think especially in some of the like uh, Western press, it's like this is the last chance to to save the world. I've seen that a few times. I'm not actually sure how helpful that that really is because although I I think time is always a, a, of an urgent a, a, you know this is it would be better to act sooner rather than later. But it's not. Um, I think this binary approach of all or nothing can be um, maybe a little bit mis uh, could give a misunderstanding because um, you know if, if if unfortunately they're not able to make an agreement, that doesn't mean that it can't it can't still happen. So I don't know. I was trying to think of like a good analogy for for this coming up, and um, I was thinking like you know if you're on a bus and you miss you miss your stop. It's not like, oh, I guess I'm just going to go to the terminal now. Then, like, no, you just you try and get off at the next stop, right? Like, if you, if so, I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to think that there is uh, there is another chance to be able to to still keep working and acting on climate, but that comes at a cost of time. So you've got to then accept there'll be further impacts and implications for that delayed action. If that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I I think. The way I, I was I was thinking about it when you're giving that first analogy is um, so to meet the Paris Agreement, uh, CO two emissions will have to fall globally by I think about forty five percent by twenty thirty, um, and if we miss the best this year on getting agreements and um, affirmations that that will be met, then we still might get that agreement. In a few, next year and a few years, but those costs will be higher because the slope in terms of reducing emissions uh, will probably be steeper. I think that's yeah. There's a like, there's a clear like this is this so this isn't from our report because we don't go into like the the mitigation aspects of climate change. But something that's quite clear from the special report on one point five is that um, if you delay action now, you have to do more to be able to achieve your goals later on, and that can be more costly. Um, and there's you know there's always a certain point where you may you may, if you delay it too much, you won't be able to reach 1.5, right? Um, but that doesn't mean like the world, um, that doesn't mean that people should give up. And I, I worry that like this binary narrative can sometimes have that that effect on people that are listening. So you should still keep working, but yeah, like with, with every delayed action, there's gonna be implications for that. Um, yeah, I guess uh, the worry is that it might, um, oh playing on people's, I suppose, climate anxiety might um, induce some kind of paralysis when really it's something that needs to be constantly worked on in terms of trying to achieve these, these goals. Yeah, I mean, um, there's a whole research area in like the psychology yeah. of, of, of change and climate and climate science, which is not anywhere near my background. <laughs> sure, it's sure. super fascinating though. Super yeah, fascinating. It, does, it does remind me of um, how the media sometimes talk about uh, um, warming um, targets such as 1.5 degrees, almost as cliff edges, like if we go beyond that, um, it's we're going off a cliff edge when actually it's a long slope and sure it'll be absolutely worse uh, depending on your local geography. I think there was a report in 2019 um, from the UN that said the, the burden of uh, climate change will be far worse in um, nations that are low income and, and tropical than versus the temperate regions. So, yeah, sure. Like if we meet 1.5 degrees, um, the intensification will happen. It'll be worse effects for those people. But it's not a sudden increase in hurricanes everywhere. It's it's a very gradual thing, and the slower we can do that, the better. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's a key message from our report as well. Is like, well, it backs up the 1.5 report where you kind of show that every like increment of warming it really does matter you will see increased effects as, as warming increases but I think that it's not like my personal view is that doesn't mean it's an all or nothing like if you miss if you miss one goal it doesn't mean you give up right but yeah anyway that's <laughs> maybe that's more of a philosophical discussion <laughs> well, um so can we just um, cycle back a bit and talk yes, about the presence, as, as, uh, the presence of the IPCC at um, COP? So, um, like, what capacity does the IPCC have when um, it's there? Is it as a way just to kind of provide knowledge, like perhaps for presentations, or is it there to perhaps even advocate for certain solutions, mm -hmm. or is it more of a neutral body, like 
how does it um, interact with uh, COP? Yeah, so, um, well, the, the structure of the structure of COP, I don't know, I think it might be helpful to just explain like my, um, my very basic understanding of, of what goes on in, in, in COP is there are like two main areas. Um, you have like this, this blue area, which is like more for the governmental aspects and the delegations. And then there's a, a green zone as well, like the blue zone and the green zone. That's, that's, that's kind of how things are discussed. And the green zone is more about civil, civil societies and groups. And so there's many, there's just so much going on in between these two different zones, um, like different organizations will have um, like pavilions and they'll be giving talks or they'll be doing special um, panel discussions. And that's, that's going on across all of them, loosely based around the fact that the blue zone is, is more governmental and, and the green zone is more civil society. Um, and so the IPCC, we have what we call a pavilion in the, the blue zone. And we share this with the World uh, Meteorological Organization. And because it's in the UK this, this time, we're also sharing it with the UK Met Office. And so this, um, we've got like a whole host of um, different talks and sessions on different themes that are planned across the two weeks. And this is purely just for just for our pavilion. And then you might get other like country pavilions that are doing very similar, like, you know, doing uh, similar kind of sessions, but on different topics. Um, so I can put in an example in the chat. Uh, where is it? So I think this is um, just for those following. This is showing like the schedule for the IPCC pavilion. Um, and then I, the, the UN uh, FCCC website will have a website somewhere that, that collects all the schedules of all the different pavilions that are going on. So there's loads of like different outreach and people can join and, and um, listen to, to whatever they want. So, so not all sessions are open to the public, but many sessions are live streamed. So if people want to, to listen to some of these, you probably can. Um, but some are access only. And so um, that would only be for people who have um, like badges to be able to, to either virtually attend or, or attend in person because it's a hybrid meeting this time. Um, and then in terms of the IPCC, we so we have this pavilion um, and some of our authors are also going and some of our bureau members, so members of our scientific steering committee, they're going, they're going to be giving um, uh, like many talks in many different um, in instances. And then there are these like official, they're called official side events that happen in COPS. So these are like more high level events. And the, oh, another acronym is there's a, there's an organization called SUBSTA, which is the, I wrote it down, the subsidiary body, body for science and technological advice. And they do an official event where they invite the IPCC um, co-chairs to give a presentation on the latest IPCC report, if, if there has been one. And so there's going to be a official side event substa um, meeting where the working group one report will be discussed in detail. It's a three hour session so you can get into the nitty gritty like, results and, and many governments will be attending and will be able to ask questions. And it's a, it's a really nice opportunity for um, explanations of like why we know these things or how we know these things. And, um, yeah, it's a nice interaction between policymakers, negotiators, and, and scientists as well. Yeah, sure. So the IPCC is much more about um, sort of providing an opportunity for, for example, policymakers to um, engage with the science and ask questions. Mm -hmm. um, so when it comes to communicating to um, policymakers, are, are there any key steps or um, I suppose points you take to make sure um, they understand, because uh, communicating with, let's say, a policymaker or decision maker is going to be different than, say, you would present mm. to an academic audience or perhaps the public. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, I, I, this is like a bit of a unique experience from the IPCC standpoint: is that the whole process is is it's not just scientists writing the, re the report, the process itself is supposed to be very integrated at the, the interface of science and policy. So the reports are always, um, they're always framed as policy relevant, but not prescriptive. It never says that what, 
what people should definitely be doing or you know, there's, there's always options out there but we try and frame the science in a policy relevant way that that then scientists and then policymakers can take and and use um when they're, they're designing their their policies um and like the process itself is we agree with governments that make up the ipcc to uh, produce a report the the outline of that that um report is um, scoped by a big group of uh, experts from across the world and that outline is approved by the IPCC panel which is the 195 countries that make up the, the IPCC and similarly when the report's drafted it goes out for review and the reviewers will be experts from all over the world in climate science but it will also be um, uh, policy makers and government and delegations who will also incorporate their experts um, from their countries to help review as well so the review is also like with a policy focus as well so um, I think the the framing of the summary is known as a summary for policy makers it's always tried to be um, framed for for that particular org audience and that might be why sometimes people would read it and be like well this is quite um, in some ways this is quite te technical or and, and this can be because some policymakers really want to know about the technicalities of the carbon budget for example um, and so that's that's why it's uh, sort of framed in in that particular way um, but yeah discussing and communicating with other audiences you would probably want to do a different a different framing um, to in, in how you communicate those messages the, the way I explained the messages in them earlier, you wouldn't be able to, I think that's a very different way of framing than what's written in the summary for policymakers, if that makes sense. But yeah, I, maybe people can give me feedback of whether that was <laughs> okay communicated or not. <laughs> sure. Um, so an, another theme, uh, really, when it comes to the IPCC, communicating with policymakers, the COP, it, it, that comes out is really that it, it seems to be science um, influencing policymakers, but is there a is there like an inverse relationship as well? Do you think where like what happens at COP twenty six will also impact scientists perhaps in terms of um, perhaps some scientists might care about what's happening in these policy regions mm -hmm. outside of academia or um, how science should be communicated? You can we just talking about it? Yeah, I think, um, so yeah, you do, you always hear like the phrase science for policy, which is about, this is going broader than the IPCC now, this is actually drawing more on my like uh, EGU days, um, but you have this this concept of science for, science for policy where you're providing evidence to help um, make policy decisions or inform policy decisions, but you can also get uh, policies for science where um, you want to know more about specific research areas and so there might be different um, grants available for a particular area that you're, you're looking into i mean like a classic example is um, when covid hit suddenly loads of policies changed and research changed and you wanted to have more and more information about covid so there's there is like a, a different way of, of in, interacting um but in terms of i guess going into to cop that um it's not always like scientists um, are just there to explain what they they know. I mean, that's obviously really, really valuable to have that interface and discussion and the, the platform there. But it can also be a really eye opening experience for the scientists themselves because they can see um, their like you know their areas of research or areas that interest them being discussed and probably in a very different framing to what they've been used to. So it can be quite a um, yeah, like a, a a useful way to 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 see your research in a different light. Um, so one of the things for me, I don't know, maybe I'm talking too much, I, <laughs> but this is just an example that um, when I when I came to the IPCC, um, when you're modeling climate futures with the projections, you um, there are what we call these modeling scenarios. Um, and there's this huge broad range of, of modeling scenarios and very, um, so they, they go, there's basically in the report, we have about five core scenarios that, that go from roughly 1.5 degrees global warming up to, uh, it can be anywhere around four degrees, but um, it has a lot more. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's much higher. And 
from a science point of view, from a physical like research point of view, it's really interesting to use the highest scenario because you 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 know in a in a theoretical world you you pump in loads of CO2 and you can see how the climate responds and so you get this huge signal to noise ratio and you can see are oh, these things are definitely changing you can see these impacts of climate change um, but from a policymaker's point of view they kind of want to know about the lower scenarios because that's that's 1.5 and 2 degrees they want to know like well what's the world going to be like there so that's much more their focus and their priority um, and so you can really uh, I, I think it's quite open uh, eye-opening to, to to see that like different priorities from different different users um yeah sorry if that was a bit too long <laughs> no it's basically um one of the reasons to really care about what happens at the science policy interface from a scientific perspective is really to kind of understand how to give your science that great utility basically like it's not just doing science for science sake it's doing science to make sure it has a, a real world impact and that's something that can be gleaned from from uh, engaging at the interface mm -hmm. Um, speaking of engagement, um, how can, say, a scientist get involved at this interface? Um, and can they also perhaps get involved in the IPCC as well? Yeah, so <laughs> um, I just realised I keep <laughs> answering the questions with, yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> I need to think of a different way to, to respond to questions. Um, for, the, for the COP, uh, I think registration is not ended but you you can always check like if your institution has observer status because many many organizations have applied and you usually get observer status so you can uh, be able to see some of the events that are not live streamed um so you can see some of the things that are behind closed doors it, equally there's loads of things that are live streamed so you can you can still follow follow cop in in that sense even if you haven't been able to to register and and get that access um, and of course, in the with the COP, there's going to be so much reporting going on about it. You can you can follow the discussions through organisations like I think um, the Carbon Brief in that's based in the UK. They would probably do quite a lot of updates. And there's another oh, actually I'll post the link in. Um, uh, I don't. <laughs> it's another acronym. I don't know what it stands for. I I S D. Um, they have this um, Earth Negotiations Bulletin. And um, they'll give updates on what's going on in different sessions of COP. They also do updates on what goes on in the IPCC uh, plenaries. So you can always find out like which country said what and, and information about that when, uh, when it's going on. So you can follow COP through that way. Um, and then in terms of getting involved with the IPCC, uh, you can do it uh, like both directly and indirectly. Like the, the, if, you're, if you're a researcher, right, in the indirect, way of doing this is is just through your own publications like if you're if you're public if you're um publishing in relevant areas then just having those publications out in um that can be um read and assessed by ipcc authors that's already contributing to to this this effort um and it, you know the ipcc wouldn't be what it is without having this literature that it can it can read and it can assess um and also, if you're interested in research areas, there's um, ends. There's um, at the end of every chapter of the IPCC report, there are like these, um, like sort of concluding remarks, which can talk about some of the things we couldn't assess because we didn't have enough um, available literature, or it wasn't. It's a new sort of potential area for research. So, if people are interested in finding out new research areas, then um, I would actually recommend going and having a, a read of some of the IPCC chapters. Um, and yeah, and the other ways to get involved is, is to try and apply to be an author for the next cycle. That won't be until about 2023 when AR7 starts, so it's, it's not happening now, but you can apply to be an author or you can apply to be um, uh, a member of the steering committee and the bureaus. That's uh, through an election through different governments, but there's, there's information of how to do that on our reports. And finally, I think the only other way you could get involved is if you wanted to be an expert reviewer of the draft. So when a draft goes out for review, you can sign up and and read read the drafts like before they get released and and offer offer comments there. But again, that won't be until the next cycle because we're we're coming towards the end. Um, so in terms of engaging with the IPCC, um, there's uh, there's ways to get involved um, at multiple steps from authoring to using your expertise to review the actual literature mm -hmm. when it's produced. Um, but of course, that's time dependent. So it'll be probably about two years or so before I start doing, uh, putting out 
calls for that kind of contribution. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, the the, the chance to review drafts are, is is basically over now because the drafts have, have already done. They go through two rounds of review already over over years, but um, that's just just on the timeline that we're in. Um, and it's also depending on your own commitment. Like reviewing the report is is nice because you can when it's available, you can, you know, just review a chapter, you don't have to read everything, or you can just read a section, you know, it's whatever you, you want to and what you have time for. If you sign up for being an author, it's this fantastic experience, but it's a huge commitment. <laughs> so it really depends on what you want to, what you want to give as well. Um, so uh, before we move on to uh, some audience questions, uh, I just kind of one final uh, question for me is, uh, is uh, a key or takeaway message about, um, uh, I suppose communicating at the science policy interface uh, about the audience could take away from today or engaging with that interface? Um, well, I think it's just a really, I found it a really interesting experience where you can, I guess what I was saying before that you you see how your your research can be uh, framed differently and it's it's just a different way of thinking about basically the same topic, it's just coming from different, different points of view. Um, but yeah, I I don't really know what else to say. I think it's just a fun, it's really nice. <laughs> I really enjoy getting into it. Some people might find it a little bit um, uh, frustrating because you might want to frame your your argument or your your your, your purpose or your point. Um, and you then you discussing with maybe a policymaker, you realize that there's many other aspects that they have to they have to take into consideration. So it it can just be like a, a learning curve for, for both parties, the scientists and the policymaker, like learning each other's priorities and and having that dialogue. It's it's very rewarding, I think. So an enlightening yet challenging um can be, yeah. approach to going from beyond science but also appreciating um the impacts. Um of the science. So we'll go into um, we'll go into uh, audience questions now. I've had some sent in before this webinar and some that were given live. Mm -hmm. um, the first one was just asking about uh, the global stock take, so the global assessment. It's like what what is that and do you know about how that works? And I wonder if you could speak to that at all. I can't I can't go into detail. It's not it's really not my expertise, but um, I know that it's it's uh, yeah I, I think I'd have to try and find some other resources to point point them to but it's 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 all about it's not just about country commitment it's also about um huge areas of like what it's not just like um what what current actions are going on it's also like what impacts have happened um where are we now in terms of uh the changes that we're seeing now and and if we want to go towards um you know, 1.5 or under two, well under, well below two degrees, how do we, how do we get there? And so it can talk about climate finance, it can be talking about um, impacts and damage, it can be talking about um, enabling conditions, it, it goes into huge, huge areas. And so, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm the best person to really explain the details of, of, of that. Um, and I think oh. we'll, we'll understand it more and more as it develops as well, <laughs> going forward. So, so it's more of an, uh, the assessment of, um, or a, a detailed look at how progress is is happening and are things online to be achieved in terms of the Paris Agreement and such. Yes, um, there was a um, in one of the previous COPs, I've forgotten which one it was. They they had this dialogue that was an, um, set up between many different countries and stakeholders, which was called the Tanaloa Dialogue. And I think it was developed by Fiji, the government of Fiji, that wanted to do this. And it was like the where are we now? Um, where do we want to go and how do we get there? And so it's all this sort of structuring of, of that information to try and build further um, commitment and actions to, to, to getting to where they want to they go. And so that was like one of the, 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 intermediary, the intermediary steps uh, along this long, long process. Um, going towards the, the global stock take. But yeah, so that's not exactly on the global stock take itself though, sorry. <laughs> But again, um, it's one of those things that's not just one acute event, it's something that's having to build off um, a lot of work yeah. going previously. Yeah. Um, so I suppose people looking to get involved in this interface, again, 
need to think about it. it's it's not just COP, it's beyond COP. So you need to keep an eye out for whatever processes are going on that do contribute to the whole yeah, um, process. process, yeah. Um, I, I got a question, I think this is more logistical, so I'm not sure um, this is in the we mean it, but um, in terms of, you mentioned COP, having live streams do you know if they will have like webinars as well that are open to yeah, people so i i can speak more for like the ipcc pavilion that i know that all of our sure. science sessions they will be they will be live streamed so i think if you follow any of the social media of the ipcc you'll be able to get access to uh whatever's being whatever's being live streamed and that that link i sent about the the pavilion will have the schedule um i don't know about the other sessions like I, I think they will have some session because it's hybrid as well um there will be a lot of events i think that will be live streamed but it's just accessing that information is still um, a bit difficult so i i have this uh i found a, a web link from the last cop where they did this sort of overview of what's going on in each each session so i'm assuming on this website there will be a very similar one for cop uh cop 26 i just at the moment i haven't found it so <laughs> um if people are interested, I think I, I would try and uh, look on the UNF Triple C website and, and see what's what's available there. Sure. Um, so there's definitely going to be live streams. And as a hybrid event, I'd also expect there to be um, the capacity for online questions as well. Um, it depends. I, I yeah, I don't know about the online yeah. online questions. Some for sure, but maybe not blanket for everything. Yeah. Of course. Um, so another uh, question is, uh, do you have any tips for people who might be attending COP, especially for the first time? It's a bit like when you go to EGU for the first time and you have that kind of like overwhelmed, like, oh my goodness, there's so much going on. Um, and I guess, I, I mean, I would just try and find, uh, I would take a bit of time beforehand, try and find the schedule, see like a few sessions that you know you really want to try and put into your diary and like make sure you, you don't miss it. But um, particularly like the, I think it's the green zone with the civil societies, they have like loads of different advocacy groups, it's like charities, they do lo loads of interesting things going on. So I would just like, if you're physically going, just wander around and see what's there. I remember when I went to the, the COP that was after, it was in Poland, the one after 1.5. And um, I was going into like the, the blue zone and there were people dressed up in like as angry birds and giving out like vegan food. And it was just like, it kind of had a sort of almost festival feel. So it was, it's, it's a really cool environment actually. So I, I hope it's gonna be um, similar like uh, for, for this one as well. Um, so I, I guess uh, the takeaway from that is map out and have a plan but don't over plan, leave time to just yeah. soak in atmosphere and Definitely. take breaks. Definitely. Yeah get your priorities like find the, the sessions that you'd be really interested in but um yeah just just see what else is out there because it's huge and it's fun to explore um so just looking through the other questions i've received um one is asking like how much do you think science is a factor in these type of discussions going on at cop 26 you actually mentioned previously um how policymakers have lots of different factors to care about and not just science. I was wondering if you could perhaps speak a bit more on that at all. Then. Yeah, I mean, that can be, that's more of a broader context. I think when you've got the COP environment, the, the, the policymakers there are, are really focused on, on the climate change issue. Um, they, it, uh, I mean, obviously it depends on like the, um, the topic of, of, of initial discussion, but my experience with the, at least with the IPCC as well, is that many of these policymakers are really informed and they will have very um, like prestigious experts to help them come and um, uh, help understand the science as, as well. So um, it's, it's, it's almost reassuring to know how much they, they value the, the, the science and they want to bring it in and they, they want to make sure that the, the nego negotiations that will end up being like legal text that's in internationally adopted, they want to make sure that's based on the best available information. So in the COP environment, I think, think that that is something that is 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 is, is discussed a lot a lot in um in some of these these discussions. Yeah. Um sure. Um a few other questions I have which again talk about um how to engage with um IPCC. Um but I 
one of them is asking more about what to do if you're not exactly like a senior level scientist or perhaps mm -hmm. someone who's not wanting to um, stay within academia. Um, and maybe this actually is more speaking towards your own career experience as well as how do you take those first few steps if you're like a scientist into the um, world of science or policy or uh, working at the interface. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so but for the first point of actually getting involved with the IPCC, just because you're an early career scientist doesn't mean you can't be involved. Like, it's very unlikely that you'll be selected as an author, but uh, we've had, um, we organised group reviews of early career scientists to review our reports this cycle. Um, and it was really, it was really nice to like have this, this network that you would, you would uh, create and, and you, you know, some of them reviewed the reports together. Sometimes you had like your own set sort of section that you had to review. Um, and it's like this nice little taster way to get involved with the IPCC without having to do too much commitment or it feeling too overwhelming. Um, so yeah, early career scientists have have been involved with with the IPCC um, this cycle and and in the past. Um, and then what was the other part of the question? It was like uh, just in terms of careers. Yeah, just speaking on how best to start to get involved in. Um, work out the science policy interface. Uh, the question from is from the perspective of someone who wants to um, step out of academia, mm. but I think it could also be quite broadly for people who are more generally interested as well. Yeah, I guess uh, from, in my, for my own personal way of doing it was to do an internship. Like I was, I was kind of interested in science policy and like, um, I didn't really know exactly what that meant. So I, I applied to do an inter internship um, and it was it was based in the UK. I know several countries and organizations will do these kinds of internships. I think there used to be somewhere on the, on the EGU website, there used to be a list of, of, of like this. I don't know if that's still there, but um, maybe if, if it is still there, we could um, put it in like the link of the recording or something. But um, yeah, so if you're if you're interested, I think, and, and, you're, and an internship is available, I think that's a really nice way of, of getting a bit of um, a, a, a taster and if you if you're interested in science but still you don't you don't think a career in research is for you there are so many different other like options for still being involved with science just just not in the academic research way like you can go and work for um, you can be an expert in, in um, like uh, the civil service for example or there's many different um, private sector companies that that do um, either research or, or want to take information from research to help, um, well, there's so many different applications. So, um, oh, the, the, the link does still exist, that's nice. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, it, it's not, I, I think maybe my my misunderstanding when I started my PhD was that, um, you know, it's it's research in academia or nothing, and that's that's really not the case. Um, and science policy is, is just one avenue that you could go into. Um, so I'd recommend if you're if you're early career, I'd recommend trying to get an internship just to, to taste it um, as a first step. Sure. So really just keep an eye out for um, what programs are offering, um, I suppose, sh short term exposure to policy for science experts. Sure. Um, before I wrap up the webinar, can I just quickly ask as well, how do um, early career scientists then uh, engage with the IPCC? Will, that, will there be a call? as well, especially for ECS people, or mm. is it something they'd have to go and look for and apply for themselves? So again, it will probably be next cycle. Um, but this cycle, we at least, um, we had like youth organizations, youth, uh, like early career scientist organizations um, that would do it would do calls themselves so the i don't know the uh, they're called apex like a group of polar early career scientists they did a call for doing a group review um and then also the the yes y-e-s-s -S, which is like young earth science association they also organized like a, a group review through their their channels um so it's more like uh, early career science organizations doing it themselves and then the IPCC has helped with trying to give webinars on on what makes a good review and, and, and things like this so it's more if you, if if groups of scientists are interested it's more of a self self-organization kind of thing but it's very welcome on our side if that makes sense sure so 
um, if you're interested and you can't really find opportunities, you can create those opportunities yourself, um, essentially by organising with like-minded people. Um, and I guess they would contact the IPCC then. And, yeah, 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 you'd be very welcome to. I think in terms of like knowing when to do it, the IPCC will do like announcements of this is going up for review. Um, we're calling for reviewers. Um, and then you would know when that would happen. And then you could contact us being like, we want to do a review, we want to do a group review, um, and we can help organise that. Yeah. Sure. That sounds good. Um, we're just about out of time, so I think it's time to end the webinar now. Um, thank you so much, Sarah, for um, spending your time with us and giving up all that detail. Um, thank you, uh, all attendees as well, for joining us today. Um, this recording will go up on our uh, YouTube channel in about a week's time, so keep a lookout for that if you want to watch it. Otherwise, I'll end here and say uh, thank you again very much, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Sure. Bye-bye.